good evening everyone i welcome you all to the first pog master class of the year 22 23 this master class is basically for the post graduates to help them prepare for the forthcoming exams the format of the master class is it is in the form of a long case two students of a particular college will present a case which is pre recorded over 8 to 10 minutes after this they will be literally grilled for the exam by four examiners there will be two internal examiners and two external examiners at the end of the case there will be a quiz pertaining to this topic by the dr nilesh palkauri today's uh, quiz today's topic is on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and it will be presented by students of dy patil medical college before i go for further details i welcome our dear president dr parak niwale and i ask him i will to say a few words before that i would like to say that we all know parag he is very dear to each and every one of us and i hope that we have a great year under his presidency he is a consultant senior most of obgy at pune and a pg teacher at kamla nehru hospital dr parag i ask you to please welcome the audience thank you uma good evening all i bring greetings from pune obgy society and uh, this is the for the first program of uh, my tenure as president and it is indeed a special day for me and uh, my entire team uh, first of all i must compliment uh, dr uma and uh, dr vaishali kodenayak who are the brains behind this and uh, i am sure the next 12 months uh, we will have enriching program for the students uh, in fact just to give you a, a brief background uh, this master class is the brain child of our dear dr vaishali kordenayak who started it when she was a clinical secretary 3 years ago then came the covid and this uh, program took a back seat but last year again it was rejuvenated and vaishali uh, we promise on behalf of team 22 23 that this will be an ongoing activity and i am sure the next presidents also will come it has Uh, received a lot of accolades all across the country uh, the only slight change that we have done this year is addition of quiz and it's easily possible for us in pune because we have the quiz master himself dr nilesh balkade who chairs the foxy quiz committee uh, with us so thank you nilesh for agreeing to be a part of this program and i am really happy that the first program of my uh, tenure of the master class begins with dy patil medical college thank you to very dear friend dr hemant deshpande and dr vidya gaikwad who uh, have agreed to be part of today's program and my best wishes to the students and it is indeed a pleasure to have very dear friend dr manju puri who is uh, the director professor and head of the department at the prestigious lady harding medical college and of course dr hiralal konar whose books are so popular uh, the dattas textbooks which are widely used by students all across the country for all these years so thank you dr manju puri and dr hiralal konar who is also a past chair person of icog uh, under whom i worked as a governing council member so my best wishes to the students and best wishes to my team i am happy to have all my office bearers here dr uma herself is the executive vice president dr ashish kale ashish if you could switch on your camera all the students will see who the general secretary for this year is dr manjri vasankar the dynamic clinical secretary and the kuber himself the treasurer dr chaitanya ganpule of course i uh, must acknowledge presence of my beta half who is always there to see uh, whether my my conduct of the program is well so best wishes to both uh, the students who are going to present today and uh, thank you uma uh, let's begin with the program yes. uh, uh, before we start i'll uh, the conveners for this program are myself dr uma vankhede and dr vaishali kurde naik and we have very four great examiners the external examiner dr hiralal konar sir who is professor and head at the department of obgy at the kpc medical college and hospital kolkata sir you have a very great bio data but as parag said till today i am reading your three textbooks on obstetric gynec and clinics 
and I really, really appreciate how you have written the three books. The second internal examiner is Dr. Himan Deshpande, sir. He's a teacher of teachers, professor and head at D.Y. Patil Medical College, also deputy dean there. And uh, sir, we are always fascinated by your talks and uh, how you have demonstrated the stitch, the b -Lin stitch. I really never will never forget. Our next external examiner is our dear Manju Puri, madam who is director, professor, and former HOD, Department of Obstetry and Gynec at the Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. New, but madam, I wish to say that you were also there for last year's first master class on multiple pregnancy, and it was so much appreciated by the students. And our fourth examiner is my dear friend, Dr. Vidya Gaikwad, who is professor at the Dr. D. Y. Patil Medical College. Now we have our dear students, Dr. Chetan Gulati, and Dr. Mona Lisa Sarkar. They are both third year students of D.Y. Patel Medical College and they will be presenting the case followed by the Paiva Bosi. I wish both of them the best of luck and also thank my whole POGS team who have always encouraged us, especially Manjuri, Dr. Ashish and Dr. Chaitanya. Thank you so much. Uh, Saurabh, please play the video. I'll stop sharing the screen. Now, Doctor, now Saurav will play the video. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Chetan Gulati. I am Dr. Mona Lisa Sarkar. We are from Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College, Pune. Today, we are presenting a case on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. My patient, Mrs. Rani, is a 30-year-old homemaker. She is a resident of Alandi and belongs to the upper middle class according to the modified Kupuswami scale. The patient is a primary gravida with 8 months of amenorrhea. She was referred to us from a PHC with complaints of bilateral swelling of legs since one month along with raised BP reading during the ANC visit. She was admitted with us for further evaluation. Her last menstrual period was 4th of September 2021 bringing her estimated date of delivery to 11th of June 2022, with the current period of gestation being 30 weeks and 6 days. Going over to the history of presenting illness, the patient was apparently well one month back when she noticed swelling in her bilateral lower limbs. She went to the PHC for a regular ANC visit and was referred to us from the same PHC with complaints of bilateral pedal edema, which was reaching up to the knee. It is gradually progressive for the past one month, present throughout the day and not relieved on rest. This pedal edema is not associated with any complaints of palpitations, orthopnea, decreased urine output, jaundice or easy fatigability. She is perceiving fetal movements well. There is no history of headache, epigastric pain, blurring of vision, nausea or vomiting. Over to the history of present pregnancy. First trimester, the pregnancy was confirmed by UPT at home which was followed by a transvaginal sonography, which was done at around two months of amenorrhea. There is no history suggestive of hyperemesis gravidarum, no history of any fever with rashes, no history of bleeding per vaginum or any abnormal vaginal discharge in the first trimester. Folic acid supplementation was taken. Coming over to the second trimester, iron and calcium supplementation were taken. Quickening was felt at around five months. Tetanus toxoid was given. An anomaly scan was done at around 20 weeks of gestation, which was found to be normal as per the patient. During the third trimester, the patient complained of bilateral pedal edema and came to the ANC for the similar complaints. She still perceives the fetal movements well. Her menstrual history. The patient attained menarche at the age of 14 years. Her cycles were of 28 to 30 days. The flow was regular for around 3 to 4 days. It was not associated with any dysmenorrhea or clots. The patient has been married for 2 years and it was a non-consanguinous marriage. Patient has no past history suggestive of diabetes mellitus, any thyroid disorders, epilepsy, any bleeding disorders. There is no significant history of any drug intake and no history of any surgeries in the past. No history of hypertension or preeclampsia in the family also. Over to her personal history, 
The patient takes a mixed diet. She has a normal sleep pattern. Her bladder and bowel habits are normal. There was no history suggestive of any substance intake or abuse. Her total cal calorie intake was calculated to be 2360 kilocalories and total protein intake was calculated as 40.4 grams. Now coming over to the examination. Prior to the examination, consent was taken and we had introduced ourselves to the patient. The patient is comfortable at rest. She is conscious, cooperative, oriented to time, place and person. She is moderately built and nourished. Her BMI is 21. Rani, upar dekho. Niche dekho. Jeep dekhao. Haat dekhao. There is no paler, ictris, cyanosis. Aise karo, Rani. There is no clubbing. There is no generalized lymphadenopathy. Bilateral pitting pedal edema is seen. It is also demonstrated above the ankles but below the knees. Coming to the vitals, the patient is a febrile. Her pulse rate is 87 beats per minute, which is regular in rhythm. Normal character, good volume, no radio radial or radio femoral delay, all peripheral pulses are valid. The BP recorded is 154.98 mm of mercury in sitting position in the right arm. Her respiratory rate is 16 cycles per minute. Urine albumin by dipstick method was found to be plus. Systemic examination. Her breast, thyroid and spine examination is normal. Cardiovascular examination, S1, S2 heard, no murmurs. Respiratory system, normal vesicular breath sounds heard, no added sounds. Central nervous system examination, no focal neurological deficit seen. Prior to obstetric examination, the patient was asked to void her bladder. The abdomen is longitudinally enlarged. Linea nigra is seen. The umbilicus is central in position and flushed to the skin. No dilated veins, no scars and sinuses seen. The fundal height corresponds to 30 weeks of gestation. In the fundal grip, a soft, broad, non blottable part suggestive of the breach is palpable. Uniform curvilinear resistant, resistance felt on the right side, suggestive of the back. Irregular knobby structures palpable, suggestive of the limb on the left side. In the first pelvic grip, a hard round blottable structure palpable, suggestive of the head. The head is floating. The lycor appears to be adequate and the uterus is relaxed. On auscultation, the fetal heart sound was heard on the right spino umbilical line and was found to be around 150 beats per minute. To summarize the case, a 30 year old primary gravida presented to us with complaints of bilateral pitting pedal edema right, right. for a uh, month, wait, 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 not lead with rest, new onset elevated blood pressure reading of 154.98 mm of mercury was recorded with urine protein plus 3 on lipstick. On examination, the uterine size was corresponding to the gestational age with single live fetus in cephalic presentation with adequate lyco admitted for further evaluation. Coming over to the diagnosis, primary gravida, 30 weeks of gestation with preeclampsia not associated with any severe features. Thank you so much. Uh, now I request the examiners to start. Yeah. So thank you, Chetan and uh, Monalisa, uh, for a very clear presentation. So uh, just a few things uh, before we move on to the discussion. Uh, 
we can go back from the diagnosis. So you said, uh, could you just repeat the diagnosis once again, uh, Monalisa? Yes, sir. She's 30 year old primary gravida, came with complaints of bilateral fitting PD edema for a month. On examination, her BP was found to be 154, 98 millimeters. Monalisa, Monalisa. I am asking the diagnosis, not the summary. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, primary gravida, 30 weeks of gestation with preeclampsia not associated with severe symptoms. Right. So, Chetan, would you, uh, do you think the diagnosis is complete? Uh, the diagnosis should contain all the parameters which are required for the management of the patient. So, what all things are missing in this and what all would you like to add on? Uh, Ma'am, I would like to add that there was a single live intra uh, uterine gestation in which lie that is in uh, cephalic presentation or longitudinal lie and uh, as the gestational age and the diagnosis uh, not associated with any severe features so on that so would be my diagnosis yeah. right so basically the age also needs to be mentioned because it will have a bearing on the management. Yes, so 30, 30 years old, primary gravida, yeah. and 30 weeks of gestation yes. uh, with a single light fetus in Keflake presentation, okay? Uh, with preeclampsia, diagnosed uh, with the diagnosis of preeclampsia uh, without any severe, severe features. features. So that will complete. So please make sure that the diagnosis is complete, okay? One more thing which I would want to know is that, uh, uh, did your patient have any pallor? Mom. No, ma'am. The patient. I don't know. From, from the video, it was looking that the palms were pale. I'm, I'm to say, and her, she had hyperpigmentation on the knuckles. Does it have? Uh, does it convey anything to you? Yes, ma'am. In vitamin B12 deficiency, we see there is hyperpigmentation of the knuckles. Yeah. In so case it of is a very experience, vitamin B12 deficiency is common. Yeah. So it is important that we, uh, you yeah, know, yes, comment on these features, especially when anemia is so rampant. Yes. Uh, Doctor Corner, over to you. Um, uh, that's a good uh, presentation. Uh, I missed the initial part. That's the reason I'm having some difficulty. But uh, could I ask Chetan that what makes you uh, to make the diagnosis, provisional diagnosis of preeclampsia? What features you have considered to make the diagnosis of preeclampsia for this lady? I believe, uh, if I am correct, 30 years old lady at uh, 30 weeks of gestation, did you say? Yes, sir. Right, you are. Sir, the features which make uh, me, uh, which help me in making the diagnosis of preeclampsia or direct me towards a diagnosis of preeclampsia, first of all, her weeks of gestation, 30 weeks of gestation, and her blood pressure was above 140 90. That is, it was 154 by 98. And there was urine protein by dipstick method was plus three. These are the two, uh, three things which help me in making the diagnosis of preeclampsia and differentiate from gestational hypertension as well as preeclampsia with severe features. Right, you are Chetan. I missed the initial part. Uh, could you kindly tell, is she a book case that you know the earlier blood pressure or it is the first record that you are seeing with a range of 152 by 98 millimeter of mercury? Sir, uh, she uh, was a book case at a PHC. She was following that the, of the proteinuria too. Yes, sir. Was she a book case that she was non proteinuric and then? Sir, uh, through what, her record. You see, blood pressure is a diagnostic criteria 152 by 98, if I am correct, that I have yes. heard of. I was joining late. Before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And proteinuria, you have said 1 plus. Sir, 3 plus. 3 plus. 3 plus. Yes, sir. Yes. Right, you are. So, keeping in mind whether she was proteinuric earlier. You know, defy definition says in a woman not not non-hypertensive, non-proteinuric before the onset of pregnancy or rather 20 weeks of gestation. So, what about your case to make the picture clear that she is a case of preeclampsia? She is a not a case of essential hypertension, gestational hypertension like that? Yes. Sir, previously, while she was following up in the PHC, there were no recorded readings of increased BP. It is at around 26 to 28 weeks of gestation when she went to the primary healthcare center with the complaints of bilateral pedal edema, where the first time you the see, increased you BP see, reading you was see, Chetan, You see, bilateral pedal edema, probably we won't take it any consideration. Yes, sir. It is sir. A physiological. Yes, so sir. So nothing to talk about that. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, it was at that time the first time increased BP reading was noted. 
Before that, while she was following up at the primary healthcare center, there was no increased BP readings. It was at around 26 to 28 weeks of gestation with first time her increased BP reading that is of uh, more than 150, 100 was noted at the now primary. then that's okay that's okay now then um if i am correct uh, to dr Manalisa, yes sir. that you know you have stamped her non-severe variety not severe variety of preeclampsia did you say that one no sir i have said uh, without a severe se severe preeclampsia without any complications. without any severe features yeah yes. without any severe so features my, so it's my, a case of non-severe uh, no, my uh, uh, query is what factors you have considered to level her as a non-severe group? Yes, yes sir. The, the sir, there are no features of end organ damage, such as the platelet count is normal, the serum uric acid, her lab reports were normal, and there were no cerebral symptoms also, sir. And there were no signs of imminent eclampsia. Hence, we have termed her as a non-severe case of preeclampsia. Lisa, can I uh, just ask you that we still do not uh, have her lab reports? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Based right. on the history, she didn't give us any symptoms of yeah. imminent eclampsia or any other features of end organ damages. So you can, can, yeah, you can yeah, add that there are no clinical features clinical of clinical, clinical, clinical any features. Any headache, vomiting, vomiting nausea, nausea epigastric nice. pain, any of these symptoms were not manifested uh, during our history taking or examination. Thus, we labeled it as non-severe case. Further, when you evaluate and see the lab report, we can uh, again turn her as severe if needed, according to the reports. Right now, clinically, you feel she does not have any severe features. That is yes. fair enough. What is the right way of recording blood pressure? Ma'am, the right way of recording blood pressure is in the sitting position. In the Ideally, it should be done in both the arms with the mercury sphygmomanometer is the gold standard. With the uh, device or the equipment at the level of heart, prior to recording, uh, it should be ensured that the patient is adequately rested, that she should rest for 10 to 15 minutes. She should not have taken any uh, drinks such as coffee or tea, or she should not have taken any drugs. These all need to be ruled out. And bowel bladder should be empty. Bowel should be so ideally emptied. Bladder should be empty. Bladder, should, bladder, bladder should be emptied, sorry. So I think you have uh, listed out quite a few things. Bladder bowel does not have so much of impact. So the patient should be rested. No nicotine, no caffeine. So these are two things which you have to make sure and the patient should be rested. Yes. And uh, preferably rested for about half an hour. It's okay, but she should be rested. So that is what is important. And then her feet should be on the ground. Yes, ma'am. And they should not be crossed. With back rested. Yes. Okay, with back rested and semi-reclining. So you must make sure that you, uh, you know, put in all these aspects uh, when we are taking blood pressure. And very nicely you've said, it is best taken in both the arms and you take an average of that. Now, what is mean arterial pressure? My mean arterial pressure is the uh, one-third systolic by two-third of diastolic pressure. Uh, it is, it can be used as a predictive marker for prediction of preeclampsia. If value is more than 105, then the patient is at a higher risk of preeclampsia. Now, how do you uh, screen? Uh, no, let me go back to this patient only. You said this patient was had a BMI of 21. Okay. So if we are commenting about the BMI 21 at the gestational age of eight months, what precaution should be or what else should be mentioned when we are talking about BMI? Ma'am, uh, we can mention if there is any history of rapid weight gain or ac acute weight gain in a short duration. So, so I'm asking you that uh, if you record her weight now and you record her height now at eight months yes. and calculate the BMI, is it correct or is it incorrect? Ma'am, we should take the pre-pregnancy weight. weight for the calculation of BMI. Ma'am, it was taken pre-pregnancy. Pre-pregnancy weight was taken, ma'am. So I think it is always a good idea to mention that uh, her BMI is 21 based upon her pre-pregnancy pre uh, you know, weight. So that is uh, very important to mention, okay? And uh, one more thing which I want you to know was uh, that breast examination should not be included as a part of systemic examination. It can be clubbed separately, okay? And uh, so is true about thyroid because that also does not come as a part of systemic examination. It comes as a part of general physical examination. So I think that is what is important to mention. 
and uh, rest all from my side was okay. Dr. Kohler, do you want to ask anything about the history part? Otherwise, we can start moving on to the evaluation. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, one more thing which I would want to know is, you said the patient was uh, uh, on iron and calcium intake. Okay. So what uh, precautions would you, uh, or what instructions would you give to a patient wherein you are uh, advising iron and calcium? Ma'am, we would uh, advise her to, it, is, it should be ideally taken before food, but a lot of patients complain of nausea, vomiting. Hence, we would advise her to take it after food, uh, after food in the afternoon, so that uh, she doesn't have those complaints. And uh, later on, when she comes to us during the ANC visit, we would like to check the compliance by asking the stool colors, because it's very important to take uh, iron calcium regularly in the ANC period, because the incidence of nutritional anemia is very rampant in India. Sir, would you want to add on something? Would you, do you agree or do you disagree? Yeah. Ma'am, we would advise her not to take tea along with it yes. as that would hamper the uh, iron absorption. Iron. So, proper timing and uh, along with it, the food she is taking, that has to be advised. And can so she iron? That's correct. That's yeah, correct method is that iron should be taken before meals and, and preferably with a, uh, you know, juice or lemon water and uh, uh, calcium should be taken after meals. So both of them need not be taken you together. Take and in case she cannot tolerate iron, in that case, you can give her after meal or with meal. Yes. Okay, yes. we would avoid giving it with meal. Why do we avoid giving it with meal, iron? Ma'am, there are certain food items which we consume can decrease the absorption of iron. Hence, we like advise... Which, which food item? Ma'am, citrus, uh, citrus food okay. items. Oh, Cit sorry. sorry. And phytates. Tannins, phytates. Uh, yeah. Cereal, uh, cereals in our uh, food, food can uh, will have phytates and which can reduce the absorption. So you should be very clear about what instructions you have to give to the patients. So that is important. And uh, very nicely, you said that, how would you look for compliance? All right. Uh, Dr. Kohner, are you there? Uh, I'll, I'll call him, madam. Okay. All right. So I think we move on now to the, we have the diagnosis of this patient. And uh, mm, uh, did you mention about the family history of this patient? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, we mentioned that the family, uh, there is no family history of preeclampsia. There is no family history of hypertension and as well as multiple gestation has little bit of role, but not proven. All right. Okay. Okay. Great. So now uh, you have this patient uh, who's uh, come to you in the OPD. So what is going to be your line of management? How would you manage this patient? Ma'am, uh, you've I just seen her in the OPD. You've just seen her in the OPD. So, uh, what are you going to do about it? Ma'am, I would like to admit the patient and then we would like to evaluate her in the ward uh, because uh, the compliance and the understanding of her severity of the condition is an issue since our patient was uneducated, not so uh, aware of her condition and the severity of the symptoms. So we admitted her. We would like to admit her and evaluate her. We would like to send her blood in. Just a second. Just a second. Yes. Uh, Moralisa, supposing this patient was educated, would you still admit her? Would you uh, manage her on domiciliary? Yes, ma'am. Still, we would like to uh, admit her. But in case she is not compliant and she is uh, not willing for admission uh, and our counseling is not enough to convince her to get admitted, then maybe on OPD basis. But ideally, we should admit her and evaluate her uh, in the IPD basis. It seems, it seems Chetan is not agreeing to what you are saying. Ma'am, ma I agree. I would like to just frame it a little differently. On the first visit, I would like to admit her and evaluate her further to rule out severe case, severe features. Yes. Once those are ruled out, then I can further manage. Then I can decide depending upon my resources and patient compliance, whether to send her home or to keep her admitted for further management. You must remember that this patient is one of preeclampsia. Yes. And she is, uh, you know, uh, come with swelling and she has uh, got a BP which is high. She's got proteinuria which is 3 plus. Yes. Uh, does the severity of proteinuria make any difference these days? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. It is not at all included no, now in the cri criteria right. of severity. Earlier it was. It does not correlate with the severity. 
Now, in this patient of yours, where there's early onset, uh, you know, uh, preeclampsia, uh, pre -eclampsia. Uh, would you, and a proteinuria of three plus, uh, would you be worried about renal uh, disease? Yes, ma'am. Ma Basically, in case of early onset preeclampsia, I'm more worried about comorbidities in the mother. They are the ma major cause of early onset preeclampsia. So I would like to rule out any other organ involvement by doing liver function tests, renal function tests, complete blood counts, and if needed, coagulation profile. Simultaneously, I would also evaluate the fetus for the fetal well-being by doing USG Doppler plus biophysical profile. Using all the uh, reports, and we can take a uh, decision regarding the further management, whether we need to start some drugs, whether to, we need to keep her admitted, or we can ask her to go home and follow up with us accordingly. Ma'am, also since it is a case of early onset preeclampsia, I would also write, like to rule out conditions like APLA also in the patient. You can always consider that in mind. Yes, uh, that's correct. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you actually define early onset preeclampsia? Uh, what is the cutoff? 32, uh, 32 weeks, ma'am. Is it 32 or is it 34? Ma'am, it's Ma uh, 32 sorry. weeks. Of 34 weeks, ma'am. Less than 34 weeks is early onset. More than 34 weeks is late onset. Late onset. All right. So uh, I think that is what needs to be kept in mind. And you've already listed out the investigations. Let's go uh, in these investigations one by one. You said you would like to do a CBC. Okay. Yes. Would you like to do only CBC or would you like to do something? Peripheral smear peripheral along with it. Ma yes. So you would like to do a CBC with peripheral smear. Uh, what do you want to see in that? Ma'am, in the CBC... First of all, I would like to see any anemia because hemolysis may cause anemia. Second, platelet count is very important. Apart from that, uh, ma'am, in the peripheral smear, I can see the signs, histocytes, burst cells, which will point me towards uh, any, hemolysis. any hemolysis occurring in the blood. Anything else? Ma'am, there may be concurrent infection, so I'll also like to see the total leukocyte so count. No, something related to preeclampsia. Can you get any other clue about the severity of the disease? Pardon, ma'am, from? From the CBC and peripheral smear. Ma'am, from you the... See, you will look at platelets, you will look at uh, hemolysis. Anything else which you would look, uh, look at? Hemoglobin, you said? Yes, ma'am, hemoglobin. But, but would you like to look at hematocrit as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hematocrit yes. might be increased. So I yeah. would so like to... What do, you, what do you expect the hematocrit at a hemoglobin level of 11? Uh, ma'am, around... 32%, ma'am. 33 to 40%. It, it is always three times, okay? okay? So it would be 33%. So supposing with a hemoglobin of 11, her hematocrit is 40%. Ma what does it mean? One second, ma'am. Ma I'll just switch it on, ma'am. Just one second. Sorry, ma'am. No, no issue. The charge was not enough. No, no issues. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, supposing with a hemoglobin of 11, her hematocrit turns out to be 40%, what does it mean? Ma'am, it means hemolysis is going on. Her uh, prior hemoglobin might have been more, but increase in the hemocrit value will show me that uh, there is hemo, hemo concentration occurring. So, remember, it is nothing to do with hemolysis. It is, is more to do with hemo concentration, yeah. meaning yeah. thereby that 11 gram hemoglobin may actually not be 11, it may be lesser. Yes, ma'am. Is it right? So that is what you must keep in mind. And that is why the hemoglobin level should always be correlated with the clinical picture as well. And you also have to look at uh, the hematocrit because we know that it, at 11, hematocrit should not be more than, more than uh, 33. 30. So that is what is kept in mind. Anything else? Whenever uh, as an obstetrician, you're looking at the CBC of the patient for the first time, you have to look at other things as well. What all is included in CBC? RBC count? Yes, ma'am. Does it have any value? Uh, ma'am, 1.5 uh, no, to 3. MCV, MCH. Yes, yes. yes ma'am, ma to rule out basically anemia and the type of anemia, we look into the parameters, ma'am. It may right. be microcytic, hypochromic. In case of iron deficiency, there may be megaloblastic in case of B12 or folic acid deficiency. First of all, if anemia is there, then I can look at the, uh, the RBC, indices. RBC indices to... No, no, that's fine. Yes, uh, would you, can you also rule out thalassemia? What is Mensa index? Uh, 
Mom, can you can you rule out thalassemia by looking at uh, peripheral uh, uh, by the CBC indices? I'm say every one of us should look at the CBC very critically. It gives you so much of information. Uh, Mom, uh, ideally we to diagnose it, we do iron studies. No, no, you don't do iron studies Study. for diagnosing thalassemia. You have to do HPLC. Yes, but the CBC can give you a clue by if your MCH and MCV are low and your RBC count is normal or more, it tells you that yes, the patient is likely to have thalassemia. Thalassem. Right? And RN deficiency anemia, MCV, MCH will be low. Low. But the RBC count also um, will be low. Yes, yes. Is it right? So please yes, uh, get into that habit of looking at that and screening your patient for thalassemia. Why is it important to screen thalassemia? Ma'am, uh, it is important to screen for thalassemia as it is a genetically tra trait. We have to be prepared for the pregnancy and have to accordingly counsel the patient and the relative. And ma'am, and both the husband and, and wife, wife are further like evaluated. Minors, yeah, having traits, then it may get transmitted to the baby. And so the pregnancy can be terminated prior. And so otherwise, right? In case the woman is a carrier, because yeah. she can't be a major. If she's a carrier, you must, uh, you know, evaluate, with her husband. evaluate the husband. If both are carriers, then the likelihood of uh, having a thal major baby is how much? Mom, if the husband uh, is also a carrier, then the chances are 25%. 20, excellent. So they are 25%. Okay. Now we move on with the case. Uh, Dr. Heman, do you want to come in? Or if we have Dr. Uh, uh, Koner? Uh, madam, uh, they're trying to get his connectivity. All right. So, Dr. Hayman, you want please to come continue. and please? Please yeah. continue, madam. Please continue. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, well, so now we, uh, so CBC, we have sorted. And uh, what are other features uh, or investigations which are suggestive of hemolysis? Ma Anything uh, Serum yeah, bilirubin then, might have been raised. Right. Which, which uh, bilirubin? Direct or indirect? Uh, indirect. indirect. Right. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, LDH might be raised, lactate yes. dehydrogenase. What is the normal value of LDH? 600, ma'am. 600. Ma'am, if it is more. Ma'am, 600 milligrams the, mm. per deciliter is the normal value. If it is more than 600, then we. Mm. Think anything more than uh, 250 is high? High. It is, high. it is more okay. than 600, it is normally seen in case of HELP syndrome. Right. So uh, that is LDH. What else uh, uh, in the investigations can tell you that the patient has got hemolysis? Anything on peripheral smear? Y yes, ma'am. The presence of schistocytes can... That, that you've already said? What is What happens to the reticulocyte count in hemolytic? It increases. increases. So in case you have reticulocyte count which is high, it would mean the patient is likely to have hemolysis. Okay, now we move on to the next investigation. Which other investigation? LFT, you said. Okay, so what happens to LFT in uh, preeclampsia? Ma'am, AST and ALT are raised. Are they raised in all kind of uh, preeclampsia or they may be raised? Ma'am, they may be raised. Yeah. More than twice the value is significant, which further categorizes it into a severe feature or severe type of preeclampsia. In case the values are raised, uh, which other investigation would you like to do? In case the SGOT, SGPT are high. So what are you worried about? Mom, I'm worried about her liver function. So I would like to check for proteins, fibrinogen and other proteins produced by liver as the li it shows me that the liver is being compromised. Mom, we will also like to check the coagulation profile. Absolutely. So once the liver functions are raised, so you will be worried about her coagulation. Protein profile. factors will use value. Uh, yeah. So remember that when we talk about proteins, uh, especially albumin, it has got a long half-life. Yes. So albumin may not go down very fast. It takes a bit of time, almost 15 days for the albumin to go down when the liver uh, gets damaged. Okay. So it is fine. But here she's bringing out uh, proteins in the urine. So in any case, the proteins may be low. All right. So LFT, you are going to look at that. That's fine. Now, what about KFT? What are you going to look at in KFT? Mom, in KFTs, mom, uh, I would like to check serum creatinine 
Yeah. Serum uric what? acid, ma'am. Serum creatinine. It, if it is more than one point one, that is significant for me. Serum uric acid value more than four point. The normal value of creatinine in pregnancy. Uh, ma'am. Zero point five to zero point seven. So upper limit of uh, the lower limit of normal non-pregnant value will be your upper limit. It can vary from lab to lab. Usually it stays below 0.8. Okay. Yes, so if it is more than 1.1, that is one criteria. Any other criteria uh, as far as creatinine levels are concerned, which can qualify a patient to be in the severe variety? Ma'am, serum uh, protein creatinine ratio. No, that, that does not qualify a patient to be in the severe variety. The protein creatinine ratio will only help you diagnose preeclampsia. Yes, ma'am. So when we talk about the absolute value of 1.1 or doubling of the normal, mm. uh, you know, baseline value, doubling of creatinine also. Yes, ma'am. Supposing her initial creatinine was 0 0.5, now it becomes 1. Okay. It may be significant. That also means that it could be in the absence of any renal disease. Okay. Yes. So that is going to look at this. Okay. Which other investigation did we say? LFT, KFT, CBC. These are the investigations. Would you like to do a fundus examination? Yes, ma'am. Why do you want to do that? Ma'am, fundus examination, uh, the basic pathophysiology or basic physiology is the vasospasm of the arteries. I would mm -hmm. like to look at that and uh, fundal examination will show me the grade to which it is happening, which might further affect my treatment also because grade three, four being an absolute emergency, I'll have to terminate the pregnancy immediately or as soon as possible. Also tells you whether the patient is a possible case of chronic hypertension. In case you know, depending upon if she's got hypertensive yes. chronic changes, then you know one can make out. Okay, uh, you said that uh, this is what is about the mother which you are going to see. Okay, uh, if she's got a urine uh, uh, protein of three plus, any other investigation you would like to do? Ma'am, uh, as you said, protein creatinine ratio is. Well, yeah. So in case she's got uh, urinary protein positive, you can do a, a protein creatinine ratio. What are the other causes other than, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, renal involvement in preeclampsia? Can there be other causes which can give rise to proteinuria in the uh, Mom, patient? infections, any UTIs? Yes, very good. Mom, any renal infections or sending infections might also lead. And uh, mom, any glomerulopathies? No, that is to do with yeah, renal involvement, renal diseases, but uh, even vaginal discharge and all can get mixed up. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, um, and when we... Tumors, yeah. some multiple myelomas, benzones, proteins might yeah. be seen. So there can be a whole lot of things, but I think there is no harm in uh, getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing a 24-hour urinary protein or a, a, a urinary protein creatinine ratio. So what, what is the normal value of uh, protein, uh, urinary protein creatinine ratio? Mom, normal value is between 0 0.2 to 0 0.25. If mm -hmm. the value is more than 0 0.3, then it becomes significant. You must remember that there is a unit to it. When we uh, say 0.3, then it is for a particular unit. Some uh, labs would give it as 30 also. Is ma that okay, ma'am. Ma milligram per millimole, 30 milligram per millimole. No, when it is 0.3, it is milligram per milligram. Yes, ma'am. Ma 30 milligram per, okay. yes, per milligram. So you must remember because, you know, people do get confused. As to sometimes it comes as 30, sometimes it comes. When it is 30, then it is, uh, you know, uh, nanomole. Yes, ma'am. It is millimole, not nanomole. Millimole, ma'am. 30 milligram per millimole. Yeah, is millimole the... per milligram. So that is how it is. So you must remember the unit yes. in which it is given. Okay. All right. So uh, you said that it could be urinary tract infection. Would you not like to do a urine examination in this? Yes, ma'am. Urine routine microscopy is a very important part, which, which which should be done routinely in all the healthy females also. Yeah. And uh, it will help me to rule out any urinary tract infection. And apart from it, uh, yes. urine protein, urine glucose, these things and also be evaluated for check for diabetes or any other comorbidities. Also, asymptomatic bacteria can be ruled out. Ready. What is the implication of asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy? Ma'am, it can lead to a further infection. It can ascend up and cause a pyelonephritis, which can lead to further complications okay. like anemia and etc. Anything, anything else? Ma'am, it will lead to proteinuria, which can be confused through which we can mislabel it as preeclampsia because proteinuria is due to the uh, infection. It, 
it can give rise to preterm births preterm births ascending so much and we are very cautious about doing this okay all so right now idea. other than this this is the preeclampsia panel which we have done yes. uh, you must always mention the other antenatal investigations as well okay yes uh, the routine i am to say you have to do a hair the rl yes ma'am what else complete the list Ma'am, we would like to do a serology, a thyroid function test. Uh, OGTT, glucose. Yeah. Uh, uh, Either HbA1c or OGTT. Or BSL, B, R, B, S or B, S. Would you depend upon HbA1c in the third trimester, or would you like to do a OGTT? Dipsy, you should do a Dipsy. Yes, ma'am. Dipsy uh, can be done, but uh, in our setup, it is uh, advised that being a resource constrained and the large population to cater to we go in for dipsy but uh, according to the western or the standard guidelines given ogtt is done how would you do ogtt how do you do it ma'am uh, patient is given 75 uh, grams of glucose dissolved in water and uh, how much water ma'am uh, half a liter of water half a liter ha half that is quite a bit ma'am so 250 ml of water actually we 250 also is little more you can just make it one glass know, one and, and a half glass yeah. half a, actually half a glass 100 ml 100 okay. ml yes yeah so she takes it then then we check the blood glucose level after one hour and after two hours Fasting, to yes, yes. fasting, fasting to is taken prior to the giving of the uh, Then she takes that and, and then you take it after one hour and two hours. Okay. All right. What are the values, cutoff values? Ma'am, uh, cutoff values, fasting level uh, more than 126. Uh, more than 126? 120. Um, fasting more than 95, PP1 more than 126, and uh, PP2 more than 140. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit. Will the PP1 be more or will the PP2 be more? Ma'am, PP1 will be more. Haan, to PP1 uh, to uh, 140 PP1 and 126 PP2. Ma'am, ma we, we have to read about it. Look, I am to say this is uh, something which is very, very important. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I think you must uh, talk about it and you must know how to do it. Yes. And you must know the values, cutoff values. And when you have to do it, 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 you have to do it. Yes, ma'am. You would have just told me one value. Ma'am, 75 grams of glucose and one value of 140. So when we talk about it, then we might as well be sure about the values and talk about the values. Okay? So that is okay. Now uh, let's move on further. Uh, you said fetal assessment. So what fetal assessment are you going to do at this stage? Ma'am, uh, for fetal assessment, we can ask the patient for the daily fetal movement counts. Apart from this, I would like to do a USG Doppler along with a biophysical profile. Why do, why do you want to do a Doppler? Is it essential to do a Doppler? You said the height of the uterus was corresponding to the period of gestation. Yes, ma'am. Doppler is usually done when we suspect IUGR. Otherwise, we can just do NST with AFI. And like, so it is nothing to do with resource need? constraint, place or not. Everything has got evidence. Yes, you, you can't be doing unnecessary investigations as well. Isn't it is not, because the more investigations do, more confusion it generates. Yes, ma'am. So, you know, everything has got a reason why we are doing it. So, here you are going to do a first, you will be doing a screening, uh, uh, you know, ultrasound. And what all parameters are you going to look in that? Ma'am, the estimated fetal weight, abdominal circumference. You don't start with the estimated fetal weight. Okay, ma'am. What do you start with? Ma'am, the gestational age, the AFI, uh, the uh, the parameters, the fetal parameters, the growth parameters, and then estimated fetal weight we would like to uh, see. The answer needs to be more crisp. Any, uh, uh, Chetan, you want to add on or uh, put it in a better way? Uh, ma'am, as you said, I would start by doing uh, the AFI, I would like to check. No, no. You have to, you have to start with the number of fetuses, okay, the fetal biometry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is yes, how you go. The location, yeah. AFI, and the estimated fetal weight. 
Now, the distal leach, the placental location, the liquor, the fetal biometry, and the estimated fetal weight. So when we do, we first look at the number of fetuses, then we find out uh, the fetal biometry, whether the fetus is alive or not. Okay. And then you look like, at the placenta. Placenta and yeah. the Presentation, the placenta and liquor. Okay. And then if required, you can do uh, other things. Uh, you will calculate the estimated fetal weight. Now tell me uh, which parameter is important for uh, finding out whether the patient has got FGR or not in biometry, which is most, most, most sensitive. Oh, ma'am, abdominal circumference. So abdominal circumference and fetal weight. And how would we know whether this abdominal circumference is appropriate uh, for the uh, gestational age or not? Ma'am, if it is less than two standard deviation for that age, then it is said as less. If it lies how would you know? How would you know it is two standard deviation less? I would say, how do we understand whether the weight is uh, in which percentile uh, does it fall? Mom, it falls uh, with the 50th percentile is the center. Two standard deviation would fall uh, in the in, uh, 68 and 95 and fifth percentile between this. Have you have you seen the charts on yes, which we find out whether yes, the growth is appropriate or not? So you have a midline which is 50th, then you have the 90th centile, then you Nine. have the 10th centile. Five. Is it right? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma okay, so you should fall between 10th and 19th centile. 10th and 19th centile. All right. So likewise, you have charts available. So it has to be a serial monitoring. monitoring. It is not a single time, uh, you know, monitoring. It has to be a serial monitoring. Okay. Yes. All right. So we've looked up the baby is appropriate for gestational age. So what are we going to do? Rest all things are okay in this patient. So what is going to be your plan of management further? Mom, after evaluating, after my laboratory investigation, if all of them are within the normal range, we can discharge the patient and ask her for regular follow-up with monitoring at home or at a nearby clinic. Do you, is there a place of uh, doing a domiciliary management in a patient who's got preeclampsia? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, preeclampsia patients, uh, their management is the same as gestational hypertension management. If until and unless the blood pressure is not more than 160 100 or according to the nice guidelines more than 150 100 we do not start medication we just monitor them regularly in well if you if you want a safe answer then uh, it is preferable to keep patients with preeclampsia hospitalized yes, uh, and uh, to manage patients who are gestational hypertension uh, that is possible on domiciliary management so uh, preeclampsia to be managed uh, uh, on domiciliary basis is not actually uh, acceptable now. Is it right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, because the patients can, uh, you know, worsen any time. Yes, ma'am. So we basically, ask them for the symptoms on regular basis, check their BP four hourly, and uh, only in case she is not compliant at all and we are not able to convince her, then only we will agree for OPD basis patient and we will prior to that, we'll ex uh, explain her the severity and how to uh, like report to the hospital immediately uh, in case she has any severe features. Mom, and also, uh, she should record her BP regularly at home also. How frequently do you think you will have to do her investigations in case she's the uh, diagnosed case of preeclampsia? Ma'am, weekly. Would you repeat? Ma'am, Ma weekly we'll like to repeat the lab investigation. Ma'am, in case it is preeclampsia without any severe features, I would like to repeat them weekly. In case it is severe features, then it depends from six hourly to daily. Six hourly to daily, depending upon the severity. Actually, if you have a patient of gestational hypertension, then how frequently would you do investigations? Ma'am, it remains the same as uh, preeclampsia. So do you think we, that we do you... Two weekly, no, we'll do. No, no. You mean to say that if a patient has got gestational hypertension and she's got uh, uh, mild uh, preeclampsia without severe features, uh, you are, your, you know, as far as your worry is concerned, it is the same in both the cases. The prognosis is the same in both the cases. My prognosis is not the same, but my management... management no, but your management also should be guided according to the prognosis. Yes, ma'am. And the risk uh, to the pregnancy. Is it more in a patient who has got preeclampsia or definitely, not? Definitely, ma'am. Ma'am, it is definitely more. So remember that the monitoring also will be tailored accordingly. 
Okay. So if it is mild preeclampsia, then you need to do it twice a week. Twice, twice. If it is gestational hypertension, you do it weekly. Pre and if it is severe uh, pre uh, preeclampsia with severe features, then you will do it either uh, every day, okay, or every day, or you can do it uh, uh, even uh, you twice, know twice a day, day, depending upon the severity. severity. So please remember that this should be absolutely clear. So yes, you have a different line for uh, gestational hypertension, separate for uh, mild preeclampsia, yeah. and still separate for uh, severe preeclampsia. Okay, and uh, any patient, uh, I would not go in for uh, domiciliary treatment for any patient who's got preeclampsia, especially with a urine albumin, uh, you know, uh, three plus, swollen, she's swollen. Okay, there's a lot of fluid retention. So she does not seem uh, to be a, a very good candidate, candidate to be, to be sent, sent home. Okay, so you would definitely keep her at least for 48 hours. Uh, I would not discharge, ask her to go. I'm mean, to say I would explain it to her. There's no reason why she would not be compliant. Once you explain her the risk, I'm to say she would know. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have admitted this patient yes, also. Yes. She's so why are you think, then why are you saying that you will send her home if you have admitted? She, that means she needs to be in the hospital. Yes. No? Right. All right. Okay. So uh, now in hospital, what are you going to do? I'm to say, uh, what about her BP now? So she came with a BP of 154.98. Okay, so yeah. what is the cutoff at which you will start antihypertensives in this patient? Ma'am, uh, there are two guidelines. According to earlier ones. So what, oh no, you tell me, don't tell me the guidelines. I, according in your to exam, me, will, yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma in I your will, exam, you should say what you do. Ma'am, so I will start it at 150. If it is more than 150 by 100, I will uh, like to start antihypertensives. And I would so, like the okay. BP to be maintained within the range of 140 to 148 systolic and 90 to 98 diastolic. I would like to keep it in that range. And I would tailor my treatment accordingly. Diastolic. Okay. Is there any change in the, uh, you know, um, uh, take on the uh, optimum BP, target BP? Would you be happy with the target BP of 140 to 148 and 90 to 98? Or would you like it to be 130? to 150 and 80 to um, 90 or 80 to 100? Ma'am, I would like to keep it at around uh, 140 only, 140 to 90 to ensure proper placental perfusion. What is the CHIPS trial? Ma'am, CHIPS trial is uh, con control of hypertension in pregnancy. Pregnancy study. Okay, what, what does it say? Uh, what is it about? Ma'am, uh, CHIPS trial stated that in case of severe preeclampsia, we would like to maintain a tight control of blood so pressure. Not for severe. No, it is not for severe hypertension. They actually looked uh, at the, Sorry, okay. the tight control with not so tight control. And what were the findings? Ma'am, the findings were this, that in case of uh, severe preeclampsia or very high uh, blood pressure readings are tight control generated a better outcome and in case of non-severe cases we do not need to maintain that much tight control that will so uh, one thing which a message goes from here is that you should be very clear about the studies so in case we are doing preeclampsia uh, hypertext trial phoenix trial right. chips trial you must know all these studies because you know in your exam they would ask you so this was a study in which they looked at uh, patients who had uh, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy with, without severe features. Okay, yes, and they looked at uh, tight control, which was uh, 85 millimeter, the target, and not mm -hmm. so tight control where the target was 100. Mm -hmm. And the findings were that in those where there was a tight control, the incidence of severe hypertension was lower, significantly lower. Mm -hmm. So that goes in favor of, uh, you know, keeping mm -hmm. a... Uh, 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 tighter control. So that tighter control would be anything like 130 oblique 85. Okay, that is why it can be less than 140 and it can be less than 90. Like the original one was we would say that but more towards 130 and more towards 80. That is what is recommended. Although, yes. but there has been a, a follow-up trial also. A follow-up trial uh, which was, uh, you know, followed up of uh, this uh, CHIPS trial, they did follow it up. Would you have any idea? Mm, okay. so let's, let's, let's leave it. Let, let's move on now. So that means if your patient has got a BP of 150-100, you would definitely put on antihepatitis. Which antihepatitis would you put on? Ma'am, we would start her on labitalol. 
मैनेजमेंट so this is a patient like who is who is at 30 weeks of pregnancy with a bp of 154 by 98 we were discussing the uh, without severe features without fgr and we are now discussing the uh, uh, the manager 30 weeks how many weeks is now so 30 weeks 6 uh, days around 31 weeks sir yeah 31 weeks now right and uh, clinical examination so clinically correlating the yes. clinically the it correlates with the period of gestation right you were and the uh, amount of like are clinically so clinically it appeared to be adequate and uh, have you got any uh, sonographic information regarding the growth profile or that of the fetal uh, well being status uh, sir as mom discussed so uh, while we were taking the case the reports were not available with us but we would like to get the mother as well as fetus evaluated yes. further which includes laboratory as well as radiological investigations right you until then how uh, how you are proceeding to for the clinical assessment of the case and monitoring till you organize this uh, laboratory madam has said already done and that of the um, uh, imaging studies that we are waiting for so we would like to monitor her bp and uh, we would like to do her urine protein by dipstick while we achieve the urine uh, protein creatinine ratio and while we get her infest now uh, what about the range of blood pressure at the moment so 154 98 so we would like we over 90 mm of mercury mm -hmm. and proteinuria i heard that it is 1 plus 3 plus did you say that 3 plus yes, or 1 plus 3 plus sir sorry 3 plus sir right you are so uh, what is your uh, how do you progress with this say for example we are uh, we have to wait for this um, imaging study report how regarding the fetal uh, well being how we are proceeding to monitor the baby and the mother so for the mother we would like to monitor her bp as i have said or, or earlier and for the fetus we would like to do her nst uh, Uh, like daily. daily or biweekly if she is admitted we will uh, do daily no, if and you if you say daily nst uh, what's the reason that you are interested to go for the daily nst so it should be ideally done biweekly but da uh, daily if resources are available and uh, like no 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 sir, what's the reason I mean, basically yeah. you see yes. whatever resources you are using mm -hmm. uh, there must be some reason that uh, frequency of use because of you know that resources should be used appropriately yes sir so what makes you to think that for this patient that blood pressure 150 over 90 uh, 4 or 5 you say that uh, she needs to be uh, the growth profile is normal volume of liquor is adequate daily nst no sir daily nst then i would not like to do if the other uh, Parameters. Okay. Whatever, whatever you say. Yes, sir. Um, probably you need to justify. Yes. So, what about the daily kick chart? Yes, sir. The daily kick chart. I, I, I would advise the patient to. Uh, anyhow, anyhow, um, uh, this, uh, this sonography has been done. And what is your plan now to continue the pregnancy? So, also, I would like. All the monitoring. Should you, should you feel that she should be monitored in house? or she can go home and to be to be seen in the clinic um in an intermittent way what do you feel sir definitely sir this since she is a preeclampsia case i would definitely like to admit her and evaluate her further monitor her further possible in the hospital setting yes. for so at least you are doing what you are doing 
what's the reason that you want to get her in house uh, management uh, monitoring ways or you can allow sir her urine protein is already plus 3 she has have she's having uh, symptoms such as bilateral pedal edema so i would like to admit her and monitor her and evaluate her further in patient in case the patient does not accept or any other circumstances then only i would like to go in for home management for regular ency visit and further uh, monitoring at home so basically to uh, monitor her carefully for any end organ damage features basically for that we would like to keep her admitted and monitor her uh, at regular intervals and also the features and also we can administer corticosteroids by the time i think sir got disconnected i think sir got disconnected yeah. all right so uh, let's move on further so we were talking about the blood pressure part uh, so we said that the first line is going to be levetiron okay all right now uh, you have this patient in the ward all of a sudden when you come and uh, record a bp the bp now is 160 uh, by 100 okay so uh, how would you manage her now on your morning rounds you find a bp to be 160 by 100 mom first of all i would like to check for any pre monetary symptoms or any severe features clinically then uh, simultaneously i would administer her a dose of uh, labetalol i can give her iv injection 5 mg i can start at a very low dose to just check and uh, okay. along with it you can Would yes. you like to repeat the BP? Yes, ma'am. So I think when you have a single record, so it is much better to uh, you know sometimes the uh, the cuff may not be properly tied or whatever. So I think it is always better to repeat it. Repeat the BP. Right. So yes, uh, once you repeat it, and then you need to do some yes. acute management. So yes, why do you want to do acute management here, ma'am? Uh, what I are you worried about? What are you worried about? Ma'am, there are two things I am worried about. First, the The patient now she has had severe features. I don't want her going into eclampsia. Second, for the fetus, I don't want any uh, placental abruption or uh, any other mishap happen in the ward. Also, ma'am, what I would like to be careful about cerebral hemorrhage. Thus, I would like to control her BP. So it is documented that a BP, systolic BP of more than one sixty, is it, uh, associated with more cerebral vascular. accidents so that is why it is important and of course abruption rightly you mentioned that it can lead on to abruption so you would like to uh, you know uh, give her acute uh, uh, management so uh, what is the uh, starting dose of levetiron i'm to say if you have to give levetiron what milligrams mom i would like to give 10 to 20 milligrams all right so you can give her 10 milligrams yes. and how do you administer it mom we administer it iv bolus uh, diluted in uh, normal saline slowly 10 ml syringe uh, mm -hmm. slowly over 3 to 5 minutes i will give so you don't take so long to give it you can give it over 1 to 2 minutes okay. so you can give 10 to 20 mg 20 mg also you can give so yes, you can give uh, it slowly over 1 to 2 minutes okay and then how will you uh, monitor her then thereafter um after 15 to 20 minutes i will again check her bp in case yeah. it is under control uh, i would further monitor her if it is still raised then i would double the dose uh if it is initially 20 was given i would like to give 40 and then again check i so basically basically when you are giving levetiron you can check it at 10 minutes interval okay because the onset of action is 5 minutes five yes minutes. you can always give it uh, you know check it faster in case you are giving hydralazine then you have to check it after 20 to 20 minutes so yeah so that is what you must remember so you give a, a, a loading dose uh, of 10 to 20 mg it is 160 you can give 10 mg or whatever and then uh, you repeat you said rightly said that you will uh, repeat and then accordingly you can give, and you can give it to a maximum of how much 220 mg sir 220 some people say you can give it up to 300 mg that is fine okay all right and how how long uh, what what is your aim what is your optimum target bp when did you say that you need not give any more bolus further mom uh, once the bp is below 150 100 It has come below one fifty hundred. I would not like to give any more. I would like to monitor. 
So remember that uh, the aim is to bring the, the BP definitely, you, you're right if we say by 150, 100. But in case you start with a BP which is very high, say about it is 200 or 190, then you would not want to bring it lower than 25%, okay? So yes. you will go a little slow. So you can, yes. uh, you know, kind of, if it just comes below 160, you can halt and yes. wait, okay? All right. And uh, what is the maintenance? How do you maintain? And to say once your target BP is reached. Yes, ma'am. Then um, what are you going to do? Your patient was on 100 milligram BD. That is what we started. Yes, ma'am. So what will you do now with your patient? Ma'am, I would uh, like to change the dose to 200 BD and monitor her further. And gradually, I would like to increase the doses as well as the duration. We can make it 100 TDS. We can make it 200 BD. In whatever dosage the BP is under control in my monitoring, I would like to continue that dose. Right. So you can either make it 200 BD or you uh, can make it 100 milligram HRD or whatever. So I would say you need to increase the dose. Yes. So that is uh, what is important. Okay. So this is the acute management. All right. Uh, which other drug which you can use for acute management of hypertension? Ma'am, acute management, first of all, labetalol can be used being the safest drug. Hydrolazine can be used. Ma'am, uh, Hydrolazine, in, you give it in what? Uh, IV. Strength? What strength do you give? 5 to 10 milligrams, ma'am. So 5 milligram, 5 to 10 milligram. Uh, and that also, also can be given, ma'am. That also you have to give over 1 to 2 minutes. It yes. is the same. Yes, ma'am. Is it right? Okay. Yes. Uh, now, supposing you don't have IV Levitrol, you do not have IV uh, Hydralazine available. Uh, in your... I would go for, ma'am. No, why? Your patient has already got Levitrol or a tablet with her, no? So yes, ma'am. You can always yes, find yes. out what time did she take that tablet and you can give her oral yes, tablet as well. Is it right? So, it is yes, not yes. that uh, you have to have IV preparations. You can yes. always give. Whatever is available. And of course, you can give oral nifedipine also. What is the dose of oral nifedipine in case you have to give? Ma'am, 10 to 20 10 milligrams BD. Yeah. BD. So, I'm just for acute hypertension, you can give uh, 10 to 20 milligrams. Is there any special type of uh, preparation which you can give or you can give any preparation? Ma'am, we would like to give sustained release tablets. For acute management, would you prefer a sustained release or would you prefer a, a, a immediate acting nifedipine? Ma'am, uh, or intermediate acting nifedipine. Which one would be Intermediate better? can also be given, but definitely it should not be given sublingual. Right. So you don't want to give it sublingual. So whatever, in case you have that capsule with that fluid, whatever is available you can give it oral. So yes. you don't give it. Absolutely fine. All right. So your patient is going fine. Her uh, blood pressure uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is not getting controlled. Is it right? Uh, uh, would you like to start any other intervention? Professor, Professor, may I, may I interrupt? Yeah. Yes, uh, please. please. Uh, Jetan, while we are managing uh, this uh, hypertension uh, problem, you should know basically preeclampsia is a multi-system disorder. Yes, Keeping sir. in mind what else we need to monitor while we are focusing our attention mainly to that of the control of blood pressure. What else we need to monitor also simultaneously to see how far we should go. Sir, maternal, uh, if monitoring about the maternal only fetus, I'm not saying... We are, we are. Part. What about the baby? What we are doing? Sir, what monitoring we need to go for when this blood pressure is so high that we are going for the acute management of the hypertension? Yes, What sir. monitoring we should do for the other side, like the, the uh, healthy safety of, safety of the baby? Sir, for the safety of the baby, I would uh, like to do... I would ask for daily fetal movement count. In this acute condition, I can either do NST or if ultrasound facilities available with me, I would like to check for any no, abruption. Keeping in, keeping in mind, Chetan, that the patient is in the tertiary care center, yes. I raise the issue that you are happy to monitor the mother and the baby in-house. So what else monitor in such acute uh, rise in the blood pressure you should do? Sir, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not going to understand as in which other system. Sir, the, the, invest, the others. Uh, sir, uh, I would like to check for any other organ damage which yeah. can be done through uh, fundoscopy examination. I'm in a tertiary and care center. And the investigation center. simultaneously I would like to set. And for the fetal monitoring, I would like to go in for uh, NST and 
and an emergency mm-hmm. ultrasound, ultrasound to check for any bleed fetal absorption also. and fetal well-being. Mom, I think Sir got disconnected again. Sir, yeah. So uh, basically, uh, I am not too sure what uh, Doctor. Uh, I did not understand. Yeah, uh, Doctor Konar was asking, but what I would want to know is that supposing the BP goes up. Uh, there yes, is some other intervention which you should also keep in mind. Uh, and to say your patient is likely to, uh, you might have to uh, terminate, terminate pregnancy. The pregnancy yes. So, so what else should come to your mind now? Magnesium sulfate, ma'am. Ma'am, why steroids? Why not steroids first? Yes, steroids, ma'am. I have already. Yeah, steroids. No, 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 not already. We have not discussed the steroids at okay, all. Okay, yes, ma'am. And, and, and you are not supposed to. I would like to uh, administer steroids to her. Corticosteroids. Yeah, so what steroids would you like to give? What dose? Ma'am, dexamethasone, 6 milligram, 12 hours apart, 4 doses if possible, along with vitamin K, 10 milligram. If that is not available, we can give betamethasone, 12 milligram, 2 doses. Why do you you want to give vitamin K? Ma'am, vitamin K is liver supportive. Ma'am. It is not, it is not given for support of liver. I am to say it is not indicated for all the patients. It is indicated only if your patient has got a uh, raised enzymes raised or she has got, uh, you know, a prolonged uh, uh, coagulation profile only then, not otherwise. It is not to be given routinely to all, your, all the patients, okay? okay? So, you will give us steroids, of course. All right. What else comes to your mind? Uh, uh, you were... Mona Lisa, you were talking about it. Prophylactic. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can give a prophylactic dose of magnesium sulfate. Otherwise, right. we would, uh, if the, yeah, yes, ma'am. So, prophylactic dose will be four to six uh, grams, ma'am, IV, with followed by one gram per hour. All right. So, uh, is there any difference between the prophylactic dose and therapeutic dose of magnesium sulfate? Ma'am, prophylactically, the loading dose is given more slowly, over 15 to 20 minutes, and followed by. Is there any difference? Is there any difference as far as uh, yes, ma'am? The iron dose is not there in the loading dose. In the Pritchard, do you Chetan, do you agree with uh, Mona Lisa? Ma'am, in the prophylactic dose, I am doing this to prevent it. So I will give, as she said, four to six milligram IV slowly ma'am. over uh, so slowly over 15 to 20 minutes. Then I would put her on one gram per hour dose. But so, if it there, was for, so, there is no difference yes. as far as the therapeutic and uh, uh, prophylactic dose is concerned. It is the same whether you give it by yes, Pritchard no. or you give by Zuspin. So, if you are giving uh, uh, IV loading dose and you are following it up with uh, uh, infusion, yes. So, no. what regime is that? What do you call that regime? What is the name of that regime? Zuspin regime. Zuspin regime. And in Pritchard, what do you do? How much is the loading dose? Mom, loading dose is. 4 uh, gram IV, 20% yeah. solution and uh, 10 grams IM, 50% solution. Ma'am. And then every 4 hourly, 5 mm-hmm. gram alternate buttocks. That is the maintenance. So whether your patient is on prophylactic or she is on uh, therapeutic, you need to give magnesium sulfate in the same way. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So remember that there is I, no difference. Okay. Is it right? It is full dose. Only then will her blood levels be uh, maintained no? and that will have uh, a preventive effect as far as eclampsia is concerned. Are we clear about it? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, all right. So you give uh, steroids to your patient, you've given, uh, you know, uh, magnesium sulfate. What additional advantage does magnesium sulfate have at 30 weeks? A neuroprotection for the baby, ma'am. Right. Prevention so, of intracranial. So even if your patient, uh, uh, you know, we have to uh, terminate is, early. Yeah. Yeah, so fetal prognosis it, becomes better. Yeah, yeah. So I think it is important that we uh, give magnesium sulfate uh, at least starting four to six hours before uh, the plant delivery. Okay, yeah. all right. So now she's at uh, 30 weeks plus six days, you said? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and she has all these uh, problems. And now, uh, what is uh, when would you like to terminate the pregnancy? Ma'am, my uh, decision of terminating the pregnancy. In my patient, I would like to take the pregnancy till 37 weeks. So even but if she's had this high BP and uh, she's In got my patient, she, if there is no severe she, symptoms, in case, as you told, she has high, had this high BP readings or any other severe features, I would like to take her to 34 weeks 
but there are some other indications which will uh, prompt me to terminate the pregnancy immediately without taking into consideration or irrespective of the period of gestation. The conditions are yes. like... What, what conditions? List them out. Yes, ma'am. Impending eclampsia, HELP syndrome, uh, there is any reversal and diastolic flow or absent and diastolic flow. There is any cerebral hemorrhage. There is any placental abruption, any pulmonary edema. These are the cases where I would DIC. like to DIC. These are the cases where I would like to immediately terminate the pregnancy irrespective of the period of gestation. Any, any symptoms? I'm to say what you are talking about is a very, very severe form where already the damage has happened. From the cerebral symptoms, if she complains of any visual disturbances, headache. nausea, vomiting, headache, epigastric pain, then also I would like to terminate her. So you have to go, uh, uh, you know, more based on the symptoms and the investigations and take a call yes. uh, that you need to terminate the pregnancy. Yes. Okay. All right. So great, how would great for fundoscopic changes. I First. would like to terminate them. How would you terminate the pregnancy? Ma'am, my choice of termination of the pregnancy would be vaginal delivery, but that would depend upon the uh, the cervix, whether it is ripe or not. Being this far away from the due date, this, I, it is highly unlikely that the cervix would be ripe. So I would not like to land her in a prolonged labor by inducing her. In this case, I would go in for a cesarean section, but in case cervix is ripe and I feel that, okay, uh, termination can be done through vaginal delivery in the next four to six hours, then I would go in for vaginal delivery. I don't think so. I, you can definitely consider her for a trial. Um, I'm to say you have to talk to the patient, discuss it out. Sometimes these patients do respond very well. So uh, at least you can, um, you know, start the process of uh, uh, cervical ripening, but if she does not respond, of course, your threshold for doing a cesarean would be uh, very low. Uh, can I pass on the, uh, uh, you know, pass it on to the internals to uh, take you through a few questions, please? Yeah. Yes. Chetan, uh, can you tell me about the preventive aspects of preeclampsia? Are there any proven methods or we can try to prevent preeclampsia? Yes, ma'am. Maternal and uh, fetal morbidity. Ma'am, uh, Prevention uh, is can be defined as a primary prevention. Primary prevention is the modification of risk factor. There are few risk factors which can be categorized as high risk or moderate risk factors. Those uh, we would like to modify. Otherwise, yes. so one is assessment of risk factors. Yes. Okay. Ma what else? Ma'am, second is uh, non-pharmacological management. Even though the NICE guidelines or the latest studies have shown that. Uh, a patient of preeclampsia without any severe features should be given the same advice as a fe uh, healthy female. But I would like to advise her adequate bed rest, not more. Lifestyle modification in the form of exercises, increased physical activity. That is preconception. Yes, Lifestyle modification will come in preconception counseling. Yes, and uh, ma'am, uh, coming over to nutritional interventions, we can advise them, increase protein uptake, fish oil. These have proven some benefit in preventing preeclampsia. Vitamin and, D supplementation. And in case, ma'am, uh, we can go in for pharmacological. That most important is the low-dose aspirin, 50 yes. to 150 milligrams so per day. Have you heard about class trial? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, it is a uh, collaborative low-dose low aspirin study in pregnancy. pregnancy. This showed that it has a proven benefit of when low dose aspirin is given from 12 to 28 weeks it has a proven benefit when it should be started at the earliest earliest moment can be started when the cardiac activity is present yes. and high risk factors or two moderate risk factors are present we can start it at least before 16 weeks yes. before 16 weeks definitely 12 and weeks to 28 weeks is, is the time given in which patients yes ma'am in which patients low dose aspirin should be considered Ma'am, low-dose aspirin can be considered in the patients who have known risk factors. Suppose in... primary gravida is a risk factor for preeclampsia. Is it ma for primary gravida? Yes, so should you start low-dose no, aspirin in all primary gravida? No, ma'am. Ma'am, primary gravida is a moderate risk factor. There are high risk factors. High risk factors are basically maternal comorbidities such as hypertension, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease, thrombophilias. These are the high risk factors and then there are moderate risk factors as you rightly pointed out nulliparous 
age being one of them extremes of age and uh, bmi being more if we have one high risk or two moderate risk factors it will prompt me to start low dose aspirin okay so how far you would like to continue this low dose aspirin mom uh, if there are any comorbid high risk conditions such as thrombophilias or aplas i would continue it till 36 weeks otherwise according to guidelines i will take it till 28 weeks but we do continue do them till 36 weeks yes any other preventive aspects we can try in patients who are at risk for preeclampsia mom uh, as we pointed out preconceptual counseling and any, any role of calcium yes ma'am mom calcium supplementation has a, a role it is still disputed but it has shown in some studies beneficial role 2 gram per day calcium supplementation antioxidants vitamin d3 these supplements can yes, be given vitamin d is equally important because vitamin adequate levels of vitamin d calcium will not be absorbed, absorbed. but what is the dose of calcium for preventive aspect mam 2 gram should be at least 2 gram per day per day yes ma'am isn't it that is important yes ma'am okay what about prediction are there any tests by which or any methods by which we can predict preeclampsia yes ma'am mam for predicting preeclampsia as i just said first of all in the preconceptual phase we can look for the risk factors which will act as a predictive markers then there are some pregnancy related factors during pregnancy history of uh, history of gestational hypertension gestational diabetes iugr any infections these can also further lead to preeclampsia and there are markers some biochemical markers and uh, clinical markers such as mean arterial pressure more than 105 some tests can be performed rollover test isometric test hand grip test and uh, level of in first trimester plasma Uh, pregnancy associated plasma protein a its values decreased uric acid can you also be used as a very important predictive marker value being four uh, if value is more than 4.5 and decreased urinary calcium and uh, increased homocysteine increased thromboxin a2 but ma'am there is no single test or marker available which can accurately predict the test that's uh, right. accurately predict the condition yes very yes madam uh, actually the time is up for the viva okay. hello so should we just summarize it um with the madam or deshpande sir if you could just summarize it but madam we'll but uh, would you like to pass the students it is so from my side yes they have done very well so congratulations i am to say they were very good yeah well done and madam uh, and uh, puri madam to summarize yeah puri madam please summarize all right so basically uh, i think uh, the history was very taken and uh, uh, you uh, whenever you know we uh, we should make the one is we should focus on the diagnosis and uh, should make the diagnosis complete uh, which we have already highlighted how you would make and uh, it was a good it's a good practice to summarize the case like you did so you should order write a summary for every case so that you know if the examiner wants to repeat ask you to repeat then you can always give that summary which was very good a complete diagnosis and then of course we go on to the investigations and when you talk the about the investigations you must know the significance and the normal values of each investigation i think that is uh, important otherwise uh, you know you get caught because all those investigations are going to be asked over and over again and then of course a proper line of management which you should have which you should have in your mind and say what you do in your uh, uh, you right. know respective places don't keep giving choices you should always say like what you will do for the patient yes. you know you should be very clear i will manage the, my patient like this i will manage my that ownership of patient uh, reflects very well and it is like a consultant talking and you know that is what you are going to be after you pass your md so i think that is what is from my side others can please add on thank you madam uh, before we go to the quiz there are a few questions in the chat box could you please uh, you know benefit the audience with the answers 
one person yes. has asked that in severe blood pressure if you give labetalol 20 40 80 bp settles down and after one hour if again bp goes up should you again start with 20 uh yes i think uh, uh, whenever the bp is high uh, we need to uh, do an emergent uh, management because we are worried about intracerebral hemorrhage but it is also important that this this would be a patient uh, uh, wherein we should start a labetalol infusion so that you know you can uh, increase the uh, rate and have the bp controlled in the meanwhile you are uh, planning for a termination of pregnancy in this patient because of the bp is uncontrolled that way okay ma'am Uh, another one dr swami has asked already dr vidya gaikod has covered uh, how do you screen preeclampsia and how will you give aspirin so that question is covered but then one dr sandeep has asked how do you grade free protein urea you have already answered in the chat box so sandeep yes, can look into the chat yeah. box and the last yes. so i think i, I think it is it is important that nothing less than plus 2 will be significant Yes, you know, if you have traces and you have plus one, then you really need to do that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, either a protein creatinine ratio, urinary protein creatinine ratio, or twenty-four hours protein to kind of uh, know whether it is significant protein urea or not. Two and plus is usually there, but in all cases, it is always a good practice not to base your judgment only on a urine protein. So you must always confirm it with a, a urine a protein creatinine ratio or a twenty-four hours urinary protein. And madam, the last one, Doctor Prethna Ras, could you tell all the names of the trials because she yes. spoke. Yes. Yeah. So basically, you know, we have a high P TAC trial, uh, which is uh, 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 which looks at immediate delivery versus expectant management for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy between thirty four and thirty seven weeks. So uh, this trial you must look up, and they say that immediate delivery. is associated with non significant reduction of composite uh, severe maternal adverse outcome but it leads on to increase in neonatal uh, respiratory distress syndrome so that means uh, we still would go by uh, delivering the uh, babies uh, around 37 in case it is uh, without severe hypertension without severe features so that is uh, what was the end result of this and the second uh, which i referred to was phoenix uh, trial where is pre eclampsia in hospital uh, whether uh, early induction or expectant management it is again same it looks at uh, patients between 34 and 37 weeks and uh, it is shown that planned delivery was associated with a significant reduction in adverse maternal outcome and a significant increase in neonatal uh, unit admissions so we have to actually when we counsel the patient whether we are going to deliver her between 34 and 37 weeks in case she does not have uh, you know uh, severe features then it has to be a trade off which has to be discussed uh, that you know uh, we try to take her as near as 37 but uh, we need to explain it to her that there is a chance that some complications might come up uh, but we will monitor her and try and take off as near to 37 as possible and uh, the chips trial we've already said regarding uh, you know the uh, tight control versus the uh, less tight control so uh, we still believe that tighter control may be uh, better so these are the trials which one has to know about yeah thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you deshpande sir thank you vidya thank you dr punar thank you students thank you for the wonderful presentation thank you ma'am thank you ma'am now i invite uh, dr nilesh who is the chairperson of quiz committee to present his quiz on hypertension in pregnancy uh, before dr nilesh starts uh, thank you dr manju puri dr hiralal dr hemant and dr vidya indeed it was a wonderful examination i was listening to it throughout and i must say dr manju is a very kind examiner i have had an opportunity to interact with so many uh, seniors uh, from delhi but uh, you know dr manju has been very very cordial and uh, it was it was wonderful uh, listening to her taking exams of our students thank you dr manju उटर्चुनिटी <laughs> 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 We will start the quiz, which is the first quiz uh, 
in this session, which is on hypertension in uh, pregnancy. Uh, before we uh, start the quiz, I would like to uh, share the rules. So friends, uh, this is again the same quiz as we conduct uh, on a monthly basis in the Medha program of Foxy. Here you have to log in through Kahoot app or Kahoot on uh, internet. So uh, this Zoom platform, you will be able to see the quiz, but uh, you can log in through another separate device which will be either a laptop or a mobile phone. Uh, kindly download Kahoot app or log in to www.kahoot.it uh, on uh, Kahoot and we'll be shortly sharing the game pin with you, which you need to enter. So the request is those who have logged in, uh, kindly uh, log in on to Kahoot app or go on to Kahoot website that is www.kahoot.it and enter with this game pin 870-7497. Uh, I'm repeating the game pin which is visible on your screen. 870-7497 is the game pin. We'll be waiting for around five minutes for all the participants to log in. Kindly log in with your original names. Don't use short forms like SUP or DRB. Please log in again. Uh, those who have logged in with... Uh, other names by kindly log in with your own original names. Nilesh, till then, can I make two announcements? Yeah, madam, please. Uh, the next master class is on May 12. The topic is a very important topic stress urinary incontinence. It will be presented by the students of the Armed Forces Medical College. So do register. And second is we are having our uh, installation and uh, CME Replete 22 on Saturday, Sunday at the Sheraton Grand Hotel. So please register those who haven't start registering and all of you all will meet you on Saturday. Sure, ma'am. So as this masterclass is an academic feast, we have another academic feast, which is a physical meeting and installation conference of new team. And it is dedicated to practical obstetrics, a topic which will be uh, near to heart of all the postgraduate institutes. So kindly do come for the conference at Sheraton Grant. And already we have 12 logins. I welcome all other participants to log in fast on the Kahoot platform with the game pin displayed in front of you. We are not going to log the uh, room, quiz room, so that even after the quiz starts, other participants can keep on logging in. Uh, so there will be one question and four options given to that question. And you have to answer it correctly and within a short span of time. The person who answers it correctly and quickly will receive the highest number of points and will be, will be in the top of the points tally. So this is like fastest finger first of Pond Baniga Karodpati. You need to... You need to be very fast and uh, uh, in fact correct also so that you go up in the point tally. And at the end of the quiz, we'll be immediately announcing the winners. Uh, Dr. Parak sir was kind enough to announce uh, prizes for the winners. So all the uh, participants of today's program will receive participation certificate and the winners will receive a winning certificate. Along with that, we will be uh, giving uh, textbooks to the winning three first three winners and this will be uh, my textbook along with dr ashwat kumar which is what to do after mdms uh, after OB, mdms obgy this is a book by jp publication and you can get an overview of uh, different options which are available after doing your mdms exams so uh, i think We'll wait for two more minutes and we will be set for the quiz. Nilesh, we always appreciate your techno savvy quizzes. Thank you, madam. Yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful session, the first session uh, of Masterclass, and I must appreciate all the examiners. Uh, who participated, especially Manjupuri Madam, 
विद्या गायकर मैडम हेमंत सर एंड हिरालाल को सर इट वॉज अंडरफुल सेशन स्क्रीन All of the following are predictive tests for PIH, except A. Rolling over test, B. Serum uric acid, C. Placental growth factor, D. Shake test. So you need to answer it correctly and quickly. Once we get all the answers, immediately the responses can be seen. Yeah. So all of you have answered it. and more than 20 participants 17 of you have answered it correctly uh, the shake test is the right answer we go on to the next and we see who is on the podium so the podium dr neha dr fla or fi fia and dr mona lisa and dr chetan is on the fourth position so wonderful going on uh, we go on to the next question second question according to nice guidelines women at risk are advised aspirin these high risk conditions are all of the following except hypertensive disease during previous pregnancy b chronic renal disease c autoimmune diseases d none of the above what is the correct answer when do we do not advise aspirin yeah none of the above is the correct answer because all are all listed are high risk conditions in this we go on to the next to see the podium dr chetan has climbed up the podium shivangi and dr mona lisa in second and third positions respectively wonderful keep playing on go on to the third question which of the following drugs doesn't cause congenital anomalies easy one a ace inhibitors b beta blockers c angiotensin receptor blockers d thiazide diuretics the correct answer the most correct op, most appropriate op option i would say is beta blockers and many of you have answered it correctly we'll go on to the point tally again in the point tally dr chetan is leading dr fia and dr afia are in the second and third positions they have climbed up the ladder along with dr alisha who is also climbed up the ladder we'll go on to the next question the fourth question out of 25 what is the drug of choice for patients with chronic hypertension so these are the drugs listed in front of you is it a alpha and beta blocker labetalol calcium channel blocker nifedipine or calcium channel blocker amlodipine or alpha methyl dopa what is the drug of choice correct answer is labetalol so for all practical purposes any type of hypertension in pregnancy nowadays the drug of choice is labetalol so that's the correct answer many of you have answered it correctly most almost half we'll go on to the see the scores scores chetan remains on the first position with dr shivangi and dr afia in second and third positions dr ashwini has climbed up the ladder dr ayushi has answered three questions correctly in a row so she is also she also may climb up the ladder we'll go on to the fifth question for 20 to 35 weeks of pregnancy with chronic hypertension is suspected of de of developing preeclampsia following investigation is must so which investigation can diagnose preeclampsia in chronic hypertension is it a urine albumin b 24 hours urinary protein c protein creatinine ratio d placental growth factor based tests the correct answer is plgf based tests nowadays these are used 
and only four of you have answered it correctly we'll see who have answered it correctly so dr afia has answered it correctly climbed up the ladder dr chetan on second position and dr prerna on third we'll go on to the next question this is scientist round so you have to identify the personality his name is associated with a syndrome in preeclampsia identify this personality his his name is associated with a syndrome in preeclampsia so you know which syndrome is associated with preeclampsia who is he thomas eclampsia louis wenstein k r rosenberg w s samson the correct answer is wenstein only eight of you have answered it correctly it is help syndrome who was in which was invented by dr louis wenstein and this scientist we should always remember we got to see who has answered it correctly so dr afia dr chetan dr mona lisa dr alisha dr ashwini leads the points table go on to the next question again a scientist question identify this eminent personality who worked as a researcher in hypertension in pregnant women a phenomenal work for hypertension in pregnancy has been done by this person is it a leon chesley b jack bezos c carl barton or d zuspan The correct answer is Leon Chesi. This is not Juspan. Many of you answered Juspan. No, yeah, 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 kind. So again, point tally remains more or so same. We'll go on to the next question, the third question of the scientist round. Who worked at the University of Texas Health Center at Houston? he said the criteria for termination of preeclampsia so you should remember who said the criteria for termination of pregnancy is it a zuspan b prichard c sibai or d barton he has again done phenomenal work on preeclampsia and its management and the correct answer is mohammad bhai sibai and we all know the criteria laid down by him many of you have answered it correctly that's a wonderful answer and we see uh, dr alisha climbing up the ladder dr afia dr alisha dr chetan in that sequence in the first second and third positions we'll go on to the next the ninth question identify this personality who publicized low dose magnesium sulfate regimen and the personality is an indian is it is she dr usha krishna dr suman sir desai dr sadhna desai or d dr usha saraiya manju puri madam appreciating the quiz thank you madam thank you so much the correct answer is dr suman sir desai she is from my alumni institute dr v m medical college solapur and she has revolutionized the treatment of preeclampsia by giving just a low dose magnesium sulfate i'm not going to tell the details because some other questions might be related to this so uh, friends for you she is dr suman said this i who has done a very a great work in preeclampsia so now right now we have dr afia dr mona lisa and dr alisha leading the points tally we'll go on to the next question the 10th question last question of the uh, uh, identify round name the substance which is measured in blood which denotes this so this is a vessel which shows some injury which is the substance which measures this is it a sflt1 b endoglide c plgf or d fgf is it is sflt1 protein which is secreted by Uh, injury to the uh, endovascular layer that is the uh, pathophysiology of uh, pregnancy induced hypertension or gestational hypertension so we see here dr afia dr alisha and dr chetan coming up again we'll go on to the next round so aim for bp in case of severe preeclampsia is what is the bp you aim for 
वन थर्टी फाइव बाई एटी फाइव और लेस वन फोर्टी बाई नाइनटी और लेस वन फिफ्टी बाई नाइनटी और लेस और वन फोर्टी बाई एटी फाइव और लेस सो दिस इज अकॉर्डिंग टू द मोस्ट एक्सेप्टेड गाइडलाइंस विच है and the correct answer is 135 by 85 or less we go on to the uh, uh, see the scores not much change we'll go on to the next question earliest sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity a very easy one but you need to remember this is it a depression of deep tendon reflexes b respiratory depression c cardiac arrest or d anuria yeah most of you have answered it correctly it is depression of deep tendon reflexes next question next cause of convulsions in a case of eclampsia is is it a cerebral anoxia due to arterial spasm b hypovolemia c hypocalcemia or d shock very easy one most of you answered it correctly only one wrong answer i don't know who has answered it wrongly but it was a very easy one we have dr afia dr alisha and ashwini leading the points table go on to the 14 question Enel April is safe anti-hypertensive during breastfeeding. True or false? The question is regarding lactation. And the correct answer is <coughs> true and not false. next so we have changes in the points tally now dr alisha leading the points tally with dr afia and dr chetan in second and third positions dr nidhi climbing up to the fifth position what is sign eclampsia the favorite question of one of my teachers is it a signs of eclampsia are seen b sign wave in ecg is seen in eclampsia c eclampsia without seizures uh and with hepatic insufficiency d eclampsia with repeated seizures and coma what is sign eclampsia the correct answer is eclampsia without seizures and with hepatic insufficiency is labeled as sign eclampsia next question next what is the therapeutic blood level of magnesium sulfate very easy one but you should remember it is it a 2 to 4 mg dep per deciliter 4 to 8 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 friends we are on to the 16th question still eight more questions to go yeah many of you have answered it ex- uh, correctly it is 4 to 8 mg percent we'll go on to the next question what's the total dose of magnesium sulfate in precharge regimen in 24 hours is it a 20 g b 36 g c 44 g or d 52 g what's the total dose in precharge regimen we are giving a higher dose so we should remember it is around 44 g 11 of you have answered it correctly dr nidhi has climbed up the ladder onto the third position the next question is related to that again the same what's the total dose of magnesium sulfate in low dose solapur regimen in 24 hours is it a 20 g b 36 g c 44 g or d 52 g so if you know that regimen which the paper has been published the bangladesh or dhaka regimen is another low dose regimen and this is solapur regimen where only 20 g that is less than half the dose of prechard is given for it was claimed that indian females have a low body mass index and therefore they require a low dose and therefore that's why 
uh, only 20 gram is sufficient for cases of eclampsia. If there is a refractory seizure, additional dose can be given or it can be shifted to pre-charge regimen later on if there is a uh, refractory eclampsia on this dose. That's what was practiced. So Dr. Alicia, Dr. Afia and Dr. Chetan leading the point Sally. 19th question, uh, enlarge this or uh, what is the full form of ISSHP? Here are the options, International Society Study for Hypertension in Pregnancy, International Society for Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, B, International Society for Successful Hypertension Treatment in Pregnancy, or D, International Study for Successful Hypertension Treatment in Pregnancy. It's B, that's right. Many of you have answered it correctly. Next. Okay. What is the percentage of uh, percentage reduction in the incidence of preterm preeclampsia in patients started with prophylactic aspirin 150 milligram in first trimester? What is the percentage risk reduction? Is it A, 30 to 35%, 40 to 45%, 50 to 55% or 60 to 65%? The correct answer is 60 to 65%. So very high reduction in the risk of preeclampsia when you start ecosprin. Nowadays, they'd say the dosage should be 150 milligram starting from the first trimester. So we have not much change in the points tally. Many of you have answered it correctly. Last five patients. Assessment of prognosis in eclampsia, the Eden's criteria, consists of all of the following except coma more than six hours, temperature more than 102 degrees Fahrenheit, unuria or oliguria, or D, none of the above. Assessment of prognosis in eclampsia, the Eden's criteria consists of all of the following, except there are seven to eight criteria. I have mentioned only three here. And correct answer is none of the above because all the mentioned are a part of Eden's criteria. So Dr. Chetan has climbed up the ladder. Dr. Ashwini and Dr. Sailaja have also come up in the first five. It's 22nd question. Hepatic changes in women with fatal eclampsia, as seen in the picture, were first described by A. Sibai 1980, B. Pritchard 1975, C. Donald 1925, or A. Virchow 1856. Easy one. Many of you have answered it correctly. It is Virchow Stryer or Virchow in 1856 described these changes in liver. Next. Not much change in the points tally. Next. Criteria for termination of pregnancy in early onset preeclampsia is described by whom? Who described it and give any one fetal criteria. So you have to identify what is the correct fetal criteria. Is it CBI and AFI less than 7? B. Barton and biophysical profile equal to 5? CBI and absent umbilical artery blood flow? Or Barton and IUGR less than 5th percentile? The correct answer is Barton and IUGR less than 5th percentile because all the other criteria, although mentioned by CBI and Barton, they don't match the exact criteria. So the criteria was IUGR less than 5th percentile is where termination of pregnancy is advised. So Dr. Alicia, Dr. Chetan and Dr. Afia leading the point, Sally. Identify this picture. Is it A, hypertensive retinopathy, B, papilledema, C, exudative retinopathy, D, diabetic retinopathy with chronic hypertension? This is how you differentiate between hypertension, chronic hypertension and one of the tests you do to differentiate between chronic hypertension and preeclampsia is uh, the ophthalmoscopy of the patient or the fundoscopy of the patient. And this is hypertensive retinopathy for you friends. Next. So Dr. Alicia, Dr. Chetan, and Dr. Ashwini, Dr. Afia and Dr. Fia in the first five positions. And we are going on to the last question of today's quiz. What are two correct lab parameters to diagnose HELP syndrome? Is it LDH more than 600 and platelet less than 1 lakh? 
LDH more than 800 and AST more than 40, platelet less than 1 lakh and ALT more than 40, or LDH more than 450 and serum bilirubin more than 1. Only one of these is correct. And the correct answer is LDH more than 600 and platelet less than 1 lakh. Many of you have answered it correctly. The last question. So here is our podium. I would request President POGS to be remain present for the prize distribution. Dr. Ashwini on the third position. Dr. Chetan on the second position. And who is first? Dr. Alisha. I think she is from DY Patil. Dr. Alisha in the first position. So I congratulate the winners. I request uh, President Sir to kindly congratulate the winning team, winners. Okay, uh, first of all, Nilesh, it was a wonderful conduct of uh, quiz. I mean, I had an opportunity to listen to you after a long, long time. And uh, it was very well conducted. And congratulations to Alisha, Chetan and Ashwini. And of course, their mentors, uh, Dr. Hemant Deshpande and Dr. Vidya Gaikwad. Uh, there is a nice surprise uh, prize which uh, we will be giving. We are not announcing it now, but you will receive it very soon. And uh, once again, on behalf of Pune OBGY Society, thank you all the examiners. And of course, uh, I think our conveners also need a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Umar, Dr. Vaishali and Dr. Nilesh. It was very well managed. Thank you. And, and uh, Parag, a very big thank you to Saurabh Doshi for giving us such a flawless virtual platform and Kahoot platform. Thank you, Saurabh, yeah. too much. Yeah, thank you, Saurabh. So, Saurabh, had, yeah. thank you for this Kahoot platform again. So, the quiz was possible only because of the technical support from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you Dr. Parag and the say, team I, I for really allowing us it. to... Uh, thank you, thank Dr. You, Parag. Thank you. And Thank Dr. You. Parag and all the team for allowing us to conduct this uh, program. Thank you so much. Nice beginning. And congratulations to all of us. And uh, as and uh, Chetan and Mona Lisa, Chetan and Mona Lisa, fantastic job. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And as Amitabh, uh, as Amitabh and Dr. Vaishali always say, good night and take great care of yourselves. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Bye, Saurabh. Thank you so much.